Greetings and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Patty James, co-chair of the club's health and medicine member-led forum and chair of this program. It is now pleasure, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Lou Jepson, who is the founder of Open Water, whose goal is to see deep into the body with the detail of a high resolution 3D camera. The implications are broad for both healthcare and for communication directly with thought. Previously, she was an engineering executive at Facebook, Oculus, Google X, and Intel, as well as, well as founder of four startups, including One Laptop Per Child, where she was the CTO, chief architect, and delivered to mass production the $100 laptop. She has been a professor at MIT, as an inventor on over 200 published or issued patents. She's been recognized with many awards, including Time Magazine Time 100 as one of the 100 most influ influential people in the world, and as a CNN Top 10 Thinker and Forbes Top 50 Women in Technology in 2018. Mary Lou holds a PhD in optical physics, an SCB in electrical engineering from Brown University, and an SCM in computational holography from the MIT Media Lab. Ben Wang, Dr. Wang, PhD, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Profusa, is pioneering tissue integrating biosensors for continuous monitoring of body chemistries. From his early expo exposure as an undergrad research fellow at the lab of Leroy Hood at Caltech, where the automated DNA sequencer was developed, to bringing cutting edge life science tools to the market at Life Technologies Corp, which was acquired by Thermo Fisher Scientific Inc. Ben has seen firsthand the transformative impact that science and technology have to save our world. Prior to Profusa, Ben served in a variety of leadership roles at Life Technology Corp, including president of the Asia Pacific and head of QPCR division. A former management consultant at McKinsey and Company, Ben earned his MA and PhD in biology from the John Hopkins University. That, that's, we have quite the, quite the two speakers here today, don't we? <laughs> so, um, Mary Lou, take it away. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thank you for having me, Commonwealth Club. And I'm gonna talk, yeah, uh, a little bit about Open Water. It's the name of my company, but it's a project. It's sort of a crazy idea that I uh, departed. I quit my cushy job at Facebook about three and a half years ago to sort of say, whoa, maybe we can relook at consumer electronics and the trillion dollar manufacturing supply chain to lower the cost of something all of us care dearly about Healthcare. One of the problems is healthcare has gotten more expensive. As somebody that ships a lot of high volume consumer electronics, we're good at like four words in Asia cost down, yield up. And I think that we can put some things that could help lower the cost of healthcare and improve it um, into the supply chain. And it's much bigger than my little company called Open Water. It's a much bigger project. So, what we're trying to do and start is create a low cost, portable, medical imaging thing the size of a smartphone that can see in resolution and in image quality better than multi-million dollar MRI scanners. The type that um, actually saved my life 25 years ago, maybe saved other people's lives in this room, but the cost has not changed in the 25 years since it saved, saved my life. I can't imagine doing that as a person in consumer electronics because we, um, we, uh, uh, lower cost by a lot, so I think 25 years ago. So what this could do is enable us to diagnose disease better, um, use in the hospitals, um, uh, see where if, a, if the tumor is all the way out, um, and even do things in brain-computer interface and brain disease. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, right now, three quarters of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. That's actually all of us because uh, an MRI scan here in the lovely town of San Francisco is very high. It's about $12,000 at UCSF. I know, because I get one done every year. Um, and it's millions of dollars per machine. Um, and, and really the issue is that prices haven't changed in decades. 
And so how do you know if you need one? How do you know if you have a cancer, right? Like right now we know mammography for women doesn't work. Half of women have breast desperate breasts have dense breast tissue. And so they get diagnosed at stage three with mammography. If we could afford to give MRIs to them, we could diagnose at stage one or stage two. But that's too expensive. So those women that get diagnosed at stage three, they get chemo, they quit their job for a year. It's super expensive and painful. So the question is like, can we lower the cost of the medical imaging to, to, to do this? In my case, I was doing my PhD in physics and was living in a wheelchair, sleeping 20 hours a day, body full of sores. Got to see um, doctor, professors at this university, that had, at Brown University, that had a med school and no one could diagnose what was wrong with me. So I finally like could no longer remember how to subtract and didn't, I mean, I couldn't move half of my face either. I drooled, it was sort of as if Novocaine had been applied. It was not the best, the best look. I got better, newsflash. But, um, so here's the thing is I, I filled out the paperwork and I dropped out of school to go home. My parents uh, said I could move in with them to die because no one could figure out what I had. I couldn't, I, I didn't think I deserved a PhD in physics from an Ivy League school and I couldn't subtract. And luckily, um, after that, um, a professor called me saying, you know, you have those massive headaches, maybe we should spring for a scan. They gave me the scan, they found my brain tumor. It took 30 days to get it operated on and to petition to get back into my PhD program. And I'll admit it, I'm not proud, I use the, I had a brain tumor excuse. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> um, and it took six months to finish my PhD. And then with two other students, we got $4 million to start our first company and us off and running um, since then. But I never forgot how expensive it is. It's truly expensive and we can diagnose things if we lower the cost of diagnosis. And so I come at this really from an optics perspective and sitting there at Oculus and, and Facebook three and a half years ago, I realized camera chips were, two things were happening with them. The pixel size was getting smaller, Moore's Law, smaller, the size of the wavelength of light, and I knew that red light goes through our body. And so I thought, hmm, maybe we could see inside of our body using red light and these new camera chips that were being developed for augmented reality. And the only money maker in augmented reality right now, let's face it, Pokemon Go. So <laughs> all this money was being spent for this vision of augmented reality, but for sure, Pokemon Go plus plus was gonna make money. And so what's fast forward three years, these camera chips that can see in high resolution in the infrared are in smartphones right now so that a picture of you can't unlock your smartphone, but your real 3D face. And so what happens is there's about 500 lasers in an iPhone that spurt out at your face. You can't see them, they're infrared. Your eye's safe, um, <laughs> really. Uh, and then there's a camera chip in very high resolution in the infrared that makes sure it's you on your smartphone, so that's cool, it's been developed. So we're using that in focused ultrasonic pings to replace an MRI machine to transform medical imaging. So we have these lasers we've developed, these ultrasonic chips, and these camera chips. And with that, we can put them in something the size of a smartphone or a ski hat and see inside in high resolution. So last year, we made a prototype of this on a big optical table that floats on air and we're able to start imaging through what we call phantom tissue, sort of tissue, sort of things that we make out of plastic and rubber and so forth with the same optical and ultrasonic properties as the body. And so we thought, whoa, this thing has legs, it works. And so got some money, um, gave a TED talk on it, and um, got the money to build out the camera chips and the lasers. And so we're here right now with these uh, kind of a wand and a laser and a, and a bit of a breadboard and looking at reducing that to kind of a tricorder size in a few years, <laughs> putting in ambulances and so forth. And so here's what the image quality looks like. Again, we started with these blobs, finding blobs in opaque kind of material like this. And we could find the tumor, like with the optical properties of a tumor. And then we could start to find vasculature, faux vasculature. Or we would go over, we're about a block from a Safeway, so we'd buy whatever meat was on sale and <laughs> see what we could see inside of it. Um, here's some kidneys that were on sale. And then, um, then we cut all the components, we put them together, 
and we had really crappy images. <laughs> just awful, you couldn't see anything. So we said, okay, stop everything. Let's go back to these blobs and let's not put anything in them and the perfect image is nothing. It's called signal to noise ratio. You want to have lower noise so then you can start to see the signal. So then we started to do rats and kidneys and things and now we have these gorgeous images like this. So this is, these are um, some kidneys that we scanned, and this is some, these are some um, isosurfaces of that kidney. And just to give you an idea, oh, and you can see sort of all these features inside of a kidney, or a liver, or, that's super important, like, what did that glass of wine do to my liver last night, I'd like to know. And, <laughs> you know, like maybe if we could see it, we would change our behaviors. And so here's what we do compared to MRI. And compared to um, like a $400,000 ultrasound machine. So if you look at it, we're really getting there and we're doing it with just lasers, ultrasonic pings, and um, camera chips. It's, it's unbelievable, right? So we're kind of psyched. Um, and so here's, <laughs> here, so we, we, uh, we have a small animal imaging facility it's a turnkey facility. We have to, uh, you know, file reports for every every test we do on a rat. And it's red light. It's at levels that are less than you get outside in San Francisco on a summer day. But we basically have the camera chip, the ultrasonic pings, and the laser, and we're imaging in the rats. And so this is working. We're excited. We think we can be in humans next year. Alpha kits that are sort of desktop size at the end of the year, and then reduce them. And uh, so that's what we're working on. And where we really go, there's some profound applications of this, where maybe we could get hospital in the box. But what we're really focused on, we have this sort of moonshot of brain-computer interface, but if you think of, I don't know, like Elon Musk, SpaceX, right? But he wants to go to Mars and die not on impact, but they're making money launching satellites for NASA. So here's the thing. We want to work on medical imaging first to make this available and then start to use it for brain-computer interface and um, actually s surgery without the knife. Maybe we could cure diabetes, fix broken bones without the cast. Just, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about it. So here's um, some areas that we think we can enter pretty early. Stroke and monitoring, um, breast imaging, as I mentioned, and liver stuff, and also like during surgery, when they're operating on you, do they get it all out or only part of it? That seems pretty important like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, um, the leading cause of disability in the United States is not getting to a medical imaging facility fast enough after a stroke. There's two basic kinds of stroke. There's the clot type and the burst type. If you know what type it is, you can give the right drug. You can give a clot drug to the burst type or burst drug to the clot type. But if you get the drug wrong, the patient dies. So today that means if you happen to live in a city, it's, it's minutes, minutes to life, minutes to walking and talking, the probability of walking and talking again. So if you live in the country, lots of luck. The probability of walking and talking again is pretty low. So if we could put this in ambulances, we could detect what kind of stroke somebody had and lower the leading cause of disability in the United States. So that's something we're really focused on, on getting to faster than slower. But ultimately, maybe we could do healthcare at home, track your progress of your tumor, measure, you know, if you have genetic disposition to something, maybe you could check yourself even at home, like you can buy a blood pressure cuff or a thermometer. And then there's the kind of crazy beyond stuff that's not so crazy. Um, we were talking about Michael Milken earlier. I was at the Milken conference a few years ago and uh, was seated next to the, a guy, that, a former very famous neurosurgeon who gave up the knife to, he actually uh, did neurosurgery on Joe Biden and says he knows Joe Biden had a, has a brain, unlike other politicians in Washington, because <laughs> he's seen it. <laughs> and anyway, it's quite charming. And so um, they're working on focusing ultrasound instead of having to have a hygienic surgery theater and cut open, especially if you think of open heart surgery, like they open your ribs and they have to, you know, it's a big deal. And so here's the thing is there's, there's, this is now approved in the US with reimbursement for prostate surgery, for essential tremor in other countries, for breast cancer, for all kinds of cancer treatments. And 
even using the focused ultrasound in the pancreas, you can open up membranes, let the calcium flow through and insulin out. You can cure diabetes, and it's just clinical trials now. Or as I said, like just if you focus the ultrasound in a broken bone and put a nano cement all over the place where you focus it, you burst it, and can just glue the bone together, like off you go. <laughs> it's future stuff, but it's got some legs. Um, and then here's the other thing is uh, psychology right now I actually think founding startups is a, will be found to be a form of mental disease someday, but you know, DSM. <laughs> DSM is like, you're asked these questions to see if you've got clinical depression, like, are you sleeping all the time? Have you gained weight? Do you have thoughts of suicide? If you answer yes to those and a litany of, of other questions, you are clinically depressed. But here's the thing, last summer, a bunch of hospitals pooled their, their very limited fMRI data on patients to see that there were these patterns in an objective measure of brain disease. When you have that, you could see objectively is the therapy, whatever it is, talk therapy, pills, whatever it is, making it better or worse objectively. So that, that brain disease, the most expensive cost of healthcare for every country in the world. So that would be big. And then there is telepathy. Like this is, uh, uh, this, this group in Berkeley actually took graduate students throw them in MRI machines for hundreds of hours so they could get their PhDs in neuroscience, but made recordings of their brains reacting to video sequences or audio sequences. And then using the tools of our time, big data machine learning, um, a new video clip was shown that the student hadn't seen before, and just using the fMRI scan data where the, uh, uh, where the head lit up, the computer inferred what it thought the student was looking at. And then if I add to that the fact that if, when you look at something versus imagine seeing it, the same areas light up in your head in an fMRI. And we're replacing an MRI into a ski cap. So we could get a lot more data. These are grainy, low resolution. These are one cubic, 10 cubic millimeter voxel size, so about 1,200 for the brain with just a few hundred hours. You can also extract words and so forth. So I guess the main point is this is way bigger than us. We're really looking to collaborate with people on development of this. We know a lot about physics. That's a good advance. We don't know as much about the other areas. And we're really just talking to other people to see you know, how we can help as part of a solution. And we also know a lot about manufacturing stuff. So yeah, so that's what we're doing is, is basically taking that and putting it into a portable. And that's all I got. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to go home now. <laughs> Not to be blown away. <laughs> wow. Oh, sorry. So what she said. Uh, I, thank you for having having me. Um, I had a pleasure actually meeting Dr. Jepson a couple of years ago, a couple of times at conferences. She doesn't remember me. I definitely remember her. I think the uh, the stuff that she's actually doing is uh, amazing, really amazing. So thanks for sharing this stage with me. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, Commonwealth Club, for inviting me. Uh, how is everybody doing? How are you? Great. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's actually the point, right? Uh, we, we ask people, how are you doing, how are you doing, how are you, all the time. And I think the, the throwaway answer is always, yes, we're okay, I'm fine. But once a year, if we're lucky, when we see our doctors, we get a chance to figure out, are we really okay? Are we doing as well as we think we're doing? Because your physician and your blood test and whatever examination that you actually go through for your annual checkup uh, happens on in those intervals and that's the point in which you could say yeah I'm doing okay or not the problem with that particular approach is this uh, I'm, I'm uh, old enough to remember that uh, security cameras used to be one in which they take a picture every 15 minutes or so mm -hmm. right? and so what happens you take a picture and you say oh, everything's fine all the doors are closed <laughs> and you take another picture everything's fine everything's closed and the next time you take a picture, the windows open, the doors uh, down. You say, oh, what happened? My house got broken into. But no nothing in between. How was it broken into? The causality of it, what caused it? Was it the wind that knocked it open? Did you forget to lock the door? Or is it really somebody breaking the door down? That's actually a, a detail that you just miss. And not having high temporal resolution data, not having information, 
about who you are and how you're doing at, the, at real time intervals when it's truly giving you the feedback that you need to make choices uh, is a big gap today in healthcare and how we actually want to live our lives. By the way, we're not, uh, at Profisa, we're not the ones that actually are so clever to come up with this notion that real time biochemical information or real time information is helpful to you. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to wager, I see one now, I see one there, that many of us, more than 50% of us are wearing an Apple Watch or wearing a Fitbit band or wearing something that's keeping track of your steps, right? And the issue is, you know, I used to not have to do this. <laughs> no, I have to do this. There you go. Um, the, issue, the, the issue actually is, uh, uh, we, we, we have tools available to us that allows us this real-time input of information and data that allows us to make choices about almost all aspects of our, of our lives. Uh, many of us who actually came uh, from our homes to this Commonwealth Club today did so by punching the address into the Google, uh, Google app, and the Google app tells you in real time, hey, this road is closed, this road is now uh, uh, open, the traffic is better here, it allows you to make real-time choices to get to your destination much more efficiently. That data and that information impacts all of us in areas that's important for commerce, it's areas that's important for how we live our lives. As a matter of fact, it's starting to, to impact how we tr keep track of our heart and how to actually impact uh, how we want to live. But the gap that happens with between wellness, what we have today, to where we want to be, which is having that information that you could use in real time to manage your health in a way that's significant to lower the cost of health, prevent disease from happening, requires attributes of the technology that just doesn't exist today. If you have a Fitbit with you, and I love the company, I was a shareholder there one time, it's great, it, starts, it started this revolution, but if you have a Fitbit, and you start feeling a little bad about yourself, you start feeling a little sick and not feeling well. And you go see your doctor and you say, Doctor, I'm not feeling well. What's wrong with me? Oh, by the way, before you draw blood, before you give me an x-ray, before you diagnose what's wrong with me, here's my Fitbit data for the last month. This is the number of steps that I've walked every single day for the last month, for the last year. The physician's answer would be what? That's great. I'm glad you're keeping track of how many steps you're walking. <laughs> I'm going to draw the blood anyways. <laughs> Because that information is not aligned with how medical community today views what information is important for them to diagnose disorders. And that gap of getting data that you could actually trust, that physicians could actually trust to make a diagnosis, do so in a way where the experience is seamless for an individual. Uh, I used to have a Fitbit, and then I actually stopped using it after a while because I wear a watch and wear something else. It's just not something that I'm actually used to wearing. You know, we, we're lazy enough as a population, not anybody here, of course, because you're here listening to the talk, but every other person outside of this room, they're lazy enough where if you ask them to change their lives for a little bit, even if it's good for you, it's tough to break that habit. So whatever technology you bring forth to someone, has to be one in which it integrates into your lives in a very, very low friction way. And then lastly, technology has to be accessible, right? Whatever technology you put inside the marketplace to, for, for, you, for everyone to say, yeah, I'm going to use it, it has to be accessible, not just because um, I need to be able to get it somewhere, but it has to be low enough cost, as Mary Lou was saying. It has to be low enough cost where cost is not going to be a burden for people using it. If the technology that I bring forth and the sensor that I bring forth that gives you data that doctors trust and can use, that's a wonderful, delightful experience for you to use. You never have to think about it. You just kind of put on your shirt or put on your watch and you go about your day. But it costs $10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. Nobody will use it. It has to be low enough cost where everyone could actually benefit from it. And um, it, it, listen, this is not a commercial, but I, I, I want you guys to know that it's actually reality. Here we go. Yeah. So, uh, so um, this is uh, the reality. Uh, this is our sensor. By the way, uh, it's small. I, I give a talk one time and I pulled it out of my pocket. I said it's really small. And the guy said, uh, somebody in the audience says, "No, it's huge." I said, "No, it, this is the vial. It, it's actually inside. And the sensor is inside. It's a little green sliver that's floating on. I'll pass it around so you guys can take a look at it." Wow. 
we've developed a, a sensor, and what the sensor does actually is when injected under the skin, it provides long-term sensing in real time of your biochemistry. So, so it gives you the information that uh, a physician would, need, would use by drawing a vial of blood out, for example, but it gives you that same type of information um, in real time without, uh, and you, without you having to do anything other than just kind of having a sensor inside the body. Now, one, it, listen, as I mentioned earlier, there are tons of companies with many, many efforts, lots of shots on goals of trying to do this, right? We're not the first one to actually have attempted this. Continuous monitoring of biochemistry inside the body, if you suffer from diabetes, if you suffer from COPD, it's incredibly beneficial for, for, for humanity to solve the problem. The issue has always been that your body is exquisitely good, exquisitely, really, really good at determining what belongs inside the body and what doesn't belong inside the body. Anyone who's ever gotten a splinter knows what I'm talking about. You get a splinter, it doesn't matter how small it is. As a matter of fact, sometimes the only, the first time you realize you had a splinter in you is when it starts to hurt a little bit. You go, why is that a little red? And you might get a little pussy, kind of gross, and then after a few days, maybe the splinter get ejected. Your body doesn't like something foreign inside you. Mm -hmm. The good news is, uh, as a species, we ought to celebrate that, right? If your body is not good at determining what belongs inside and what doesn't belong inside, we wouldn't be here today. Dinosaurs would rule the world. Uh, but because your body is so good at determining what belongs inside the body versus not, that foreign body response, while it's great for a human species, it's awful, just god awful if you're trying to develop a sensor. Because, and by the way, we could have a debate over my next statement. Uh, over a couple of adult beverages uh, someday. I don't want to spend time here talking about it. But to, to measure what's inside the body in biochemical terms accurately over a large panel that doctors would draw blood to measure, um, you, you have to put something inside the body. It's, it's, our, it's our thesis. That to do it through the skin optically, uh, it's going to be really, really difficult. And part of that difficulty lies in the fact that a lot of what's important is the low abundance inside the body. There's not a lot of it. So it's kind of like trying to you know, find a needle in a haystack, one. And two, uh, the, the second problem is as low of abundance as whatever it is you're trying to measure, what's healthy versus not healthy is actually in very tight range. That change is very small, right? Your sodium level, if it goes up and down just by a little bit, you're in big trouble. And so you have to not only find something that's not in high abundance, but you have to measure in a way where changes, small changes, you have to be able to determine um, uh, with high degree of accuracy when those changes occur. And so you can't do that really easily through the skin. You have to do it uh, through the skin. You have to do it inside the body. Now, you have to do it inside the body. Well, how do you overcome the foreign body response? How do you overcome millions of years of evolution um, and be able to put something inside the body and pull the body into not mining it. And that's really kind of our big innovation, right? Our big innovation is that little sliver of green stuff inside the vial that you see here. When placed under the tissue, your body doesn't mind it being there. And the answer is, well, how does it do that? Why? Well, it's twofold, right? One, it's soft and pliable. So that uh, material is in the class of material called hydrogel. It's actually quite simple. It's the same material as soft contact lenses that you wear, so it's soft and squishy. I have a couple of sensors inside my body. Afterwards, please uh, come and feel it. You just can't. You can't feel it. But once you touch my skin, you have to buy me a drink, <laughs> uh, or at least flowers. Uh, second, uh, secondly, is there's a bit of biomimicry in, in, in our approach. Uh, what you see here on the right-hand side is actually a high-resolution uh, picture of our hydrogel uh, sensor you notice that it's actually got a lot of holes, a lot of pores inside. It's kind of like a honeycomb or a sponge. Each pore is a, a connected to each adjacent pore. It mimics what's called an extracellular matrix inside the body. That's the intellectual uh, um, grandparent of what we do. The extracellular matrix inside the body basically is the scaffolding where cells grow through. It allows your heart to look like a heart, your kidney to look like a kidney, your liver to look like a liver. Your body doesn't mind it actually being there. Uh, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, it embraces it. So our sensor is built in a way where the body doesn't mind, mind it being there. We put it under the skin. Body grows health, grows healthy tissue throughout the interior of that sensor. And so instead of a, 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 a traditional hard sensor that's embedded with electronics, we have to change it out every couple of weeks because the encapsulation, the scar tissue around it makes the sensor, even if the sensor still works, it's no longer measuring the body, it's measuring scar tissue, which doesn't do you much good. 
Uh, our sensor actually works for months and years. The last sensor that I had inside my body, um, it was about two years before it stopped working and I have to actually replace it. And now the magic actually happens. Right? Think about it. If you see your doctor once a year, but the sensors work for more than a year, it means that a sensor that's injected inside you, by the way, it's no more invasive than getting a vial of blood drawn. As a matter of fact, it's probably less invasive because getting a vial of blood drawn, the needle stays in there and they keep shoving the vial in and uh, the, the tube in and out. Whereas this is one poke and you're done. But once that sensor is in there, it works for as long as you need until the next physician's visit. So you literally can live your body, you live your life any way you kind of want. And the way this works is this hydrogel that's inside the skin is the you know, the jargon, it's the disposable. That's the part that actually you don't recover in terms of the cost of the system. How many of you wear contact lenses? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I should, I'm too lazy to take them out. <laughs> Once again, it's a usability thing, right? Um, if you wear contact lenses and you buy contact lenses, you know how inexpensive they can be, right? At scale, they're a buck. And the buck, that's like an 80% gross margin business for a contact lens manufacturer. It's very inexpensive to make. This thing is actually a fraction of a penny to manufacture. So what you throw away is a fraction of a penny. It gives you a year of continuous biochemistry data. What you use to read, what you use to read the sensor is really an external reader that has low power LED with a camera on the surface. So it's similar to what uh, Dr. Jepson was talking about earlier, but it's just much less sophisticated. It's light that shines through the skin. On that sliver of hydrogel, the sensor, we embed mo uh, molecules that binds to what you want to sense. Glucose, oxygen, sodium, potassium, lactate, whatever it is that you want to, you want to measure. And that chemistry is a class of chemistry called uh, uh, fluorophores. They fluoresce or phosphoresce. And uh, if something is bound to it, the fluorescence changes, the characteristics change. So now all you need to do is on the surface of the skin you have a reader, you shine light through the skin, it's in the near infrared, as Dr. Jefferson said earlier, the red light goes through the skin. It's in the near infrared range, so the light goes through the skin, but it's not strong enough, it's not like UV where it actually hurts your body. And as soon as you illuminates the sensor, the sensor returns a light that comes back through the skin. There's a photo detector on the surface of the skin that looks at the photons coming back through, gives you a, a, a value. Now, this is done by light. So you could interrogate the sensor now as, free, as frequently as twice, three times a second, because this reaction is very, very fast, or as infrequently as, well, never. It's completely up to you. More importantly, because we're doing light, if we could uh, change the wavelength of two chemistries, one measuring sodium, one measuring glucose, one measuring oxygen, etc., and you could tune the wavelength separately, then you can actually measure multiple parameters on one sensor at the same time. So instead of getting a vial of blood drawn once a year, here is the CHEM-8, CHEM-4 panel. You now have the ability to get the CHEM-4, CHEM-8 panel data every single second of your life. And you know the impact of that end-state biochemical change by your actions at that moment. Just like the Google Maps uh, allows you to come here. I usually go over the Bay Bridge. Today, I'm not going to go over the Bay Bridge because the Bay Bridge is closed based on their accident. I'm going to go a longer way around. That real-time information help you make a decision that optimizes your choice of how you want to live your life before you actually see a doctor. And we think that actually changes the world in a pretty profound way. Uh, here's a, the, how it actually works. I think I've talked about that quite a bit. Months and years. Oh, so um, what I've actually shown you is uh, approved in Europe. So we're actually, it, this is real. It's, it's, we were talking about this outside a little bit on, on what a wonderful time it is to be alive, right? But like 15 years ago, it used to be science fiction. Now it's actually coming to reality. Well, it is reality. This is, this is uh, real. We, we have a, a variety of actually data and information that uh, we could gather now. Our first applications thus far is with critical limb ischemia patients in uh, Europe. These are folks where arteries uh, are blocked and it doesn't provide enough oxygenation to the foot. You have these ulcerations that won't heal. Physicians will open up the arteries, but they don't know if they open up the arteries, the tissue is actually getting the oxygen that, in, that they need. So intraoperatively, uh, our sensors are giving doctor absolute direction on, hey, this, th what you've done is enough, good. It, it, uh, it hasn't restored uh, oxygenation yet, keep going. 
But more importantly, these patients who are usually uh, less mobile because they have these wounds that won't heal, uh, when they go home, they can get monitored remotely at home. They don't have to come back into the hospital for their one month follow up, or three month follow up, or six month follow up. They could actually get this information taken care of at home. And the doctors could tell remotely, hey, um, I know you're not supposed to come in for another two weeks, but you should come in now because your tissue oxygenation is actually starting going down, your arteries are starting to harden again. Or I know you're supposed to come in tomorrow, stay home, don't worry about it, enjoy your day because you're fine, right? <laughs> that real time adjudication remotely actually is quite meaningful uh, for us. Uh, and then lastly, this is actually pretty exciting for us. Um, we talk about measuring oxygen or measuring glucose or measuring particular analytes together. But like that Google Maps example, you know for Google Maps as a product to work, uh, a lot of things have to happen well, right? Not only are you looking at the, the map, how the roads go, but you also have to uh, know real-time traffic patterns. You probably, in California, you're also working with Caltran to understand where road closures and road work is actually occurring. Uh, you're also probably uh, in charge with, the, you know, in touch with the local uh, fire department with control firms and such. Just look at, I mean, there are a lot of things that actually need to happen for Google Map to actually um, uh, deliver the promise that Google Maps uh, delivers. Same thing with this technology. The sensor data that we provide is on the, oh, crap. Can I say crap? <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Uh, whoops. Uh, uh, our, our, our sensor data is actually on the top, and it gives us richness information for, for whatever disease that we're actually managing. But what's really exciting is if you take that information, you need to layer on top of it heart rate variability, for example. Layer on top of it pulse. Layer on top of it activity. Layer on top of it body position. Layer on top of it pollen count. Layer on top of it altitude. Layer on top of it activity, activity level. Lay on top of a respiratory level. You now have an ability in a multivariate way to create causality of not just your actions, but also your environment in real time to figure out what's causing those biomarkers to be moving up and down in real time. And I think the implication to not just how you manage your health, how your physicians manage your health, but also health sciences in, in general, what the causality of certain events within individuals is actually quite profound. Uh, so what we, uh, the opportunity uh, that, that uh, this kind of information pr can provide, uh, I, I, we, we believe is large. If you just actually, if you just take oxygen and glucose and say, I could in real time give you bio, uh, biochemical information for respiratory patients, people suffering from respiratory illnesses, and metabolic disorders such as diabetes, you touch one in five patients on the face of the planet today. One in five. So at the end of the day, what we aim to bring to bear is an approach that creates a new way of thinking about how you answer the question, how are you? That you don't have to wait until you go to a doctor on an annual basis to really understand how you're doing. That your interaction with your physicians, that really high value, important interaction with the physician, doesn't have to happen only once a year. That it can happen actually any time